Hi, everyone. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I'm Elaine, um, and I'll be talking about how you can teach personal finance to those with a low income or with a very, very low income. In my case, uh, I'm from Nicaragua. Let me tell you a bit about that. Uh, Nicaragua is the largest country in Central America, but it's still a very, very small country. And um, it's also the second poorest country in the entire hemisphere. I know that in the map you can only see Central America, like from Guatemala to Costa Rica, but we are actually the second poorest country in the entire hemisphere, only after Haiti. So when we talk about low income, we're talking about very, very low income. And before I start, I would like to tell you why I do what I do. And what I do is I teach personal finance. I started the first personal finance blog in Nicaragua six and a half years ago. It's called Plata con Platica. I can spell it out, spell it out um, a little bit later. And um, the reason I started this was because uh, I realized that we had a combination of factors in the country that were and still are a bomb ready to explode. And those factors are we have zero financial education. And when I mean zero, I mean I started the blog and, and the two words together like personal and finance didn't exist back then almost seven years ago. And it's not taught in schools. I know that in the US it's not uh, obligatory or it's not on every single state or in, or in every single school. But there is a lot of financial education that you can find. I mean, all of you here are doing financial education, right? So there's a lot of resources that people can take advantage from. Uh, we have a very low income, and I'm going to take some time to explain that low income. And we live above our means. I know that that happens all around the world, but in Nicaragua, it's something very, very common. And we have a very unfavorable financial system. And I'm going to show you right now what that unfavorable financial system looks like just a little bit. And we're going to talk about interest rate. So we have two pyramids here. The first one, the small one, is the interest rate that you can get for uh, your savings. Um, if you open up a savings account, all banks will give you around 0.75% annually. Does that sound low, high? It's OK. It's okay, okay. Um, if you open up a deposit certificate, you can get between 3% and 4% annually. And if you invest in the stock market, which in Nicaragua you don't have stocks, you only have bonds. Um, but if you do uh, um, invest in bonds in Nicaragua, you get between 5 and 7%. And that's about it. Our um, stock market only has about 12 or 13 different companies the government included, where you can in invest, and that's about it. So you don't really have that many options for those who are, are trying to increase their, their money or are, tr are trying to increase their income. There aren't that many options that, that you can take, as you can see. So what many people will do is that they, they will start a business. On the other side, for the and this becomes very interesting, on the other side, uh, the interest rates that we pay, and I want to start from the bottom of the pyramid and not from the top of the pyramid. We have loan sharks, and these are people who will lend you money individually. So let's say you need money, and you come to me, and I will lend you at a rate that it's 30% monthly. Translated annually, and it's 360%. The saddest thing about this is that it is the poorest people, the people that has you know, less income, that have less education, those are the ones taking these kind of loans. And obviously, after the second or the third month, they, they realize how much they're paying only on interest because that's all, that's all they can pay, and then the principal is still there, so their debt can go on for years and years and years to come. Above that, we have payday lending. That was like the best translation that I could find that was similar to here in the US. But what this really is, is um, stores where you can go and buy um, sofas, TVs, beds, mattresses, coffee makers, whatever you want. But the business is not really to sell you, but for you to take the products on credit. 
and the interest rate annually is between 60% and 80%. So by the time, and, and you can take out one of these products at around four years. So by the time you, end, you, you finish paying the loan, you've basically paid about three or four times the actual cost of that product. Right, so keep, keep in mind that this is people with very low income, and then you're paying this really huge interest rates, which is actually making you even poorer than you are, right? Above that, we have credit cards. And in Nicaragua, the, the, the common interest rate for credit cards is between 45 and 50% to those, to everyone who has an income of less than $3,000 a month. So remember, please, please write this number down. Everyone who earns less than $3,000 a month. And this is going to be very interesting, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a little bit. Above that, we have microfinance institutions that are supposed to serve precisely those with a low income, but they're charging between 25% and 40% annually. So obviously when you compare them with the loan shark, and sometimes that's kind of like the speech, right? We're cheaper, but it's still a very, very high interest rate. So um, they're dedicated to, they're, they're focused on very specific um, markets, especially rural markets, and they usually charge daily. So people will take out a loan and then the salespeople will go to these people's houses uh, to recover their money every single day, and the people will feel like, well, it's a, it's a small amount that I'm providing, but it's because they look at it daily, right? And since we don't have a lot of financial education, people don't really multiply, you know, by 30, by 12 months to see how much they're actually paying um, during the year. Above that, you have personal loans. These are given out by the bank, and this is one of like the best things that you can get, and the interest rate is between 15% and 22%. So that starts making a little bit more sense. Um, this, from here down, it was all uh, consume credit, and above that, you have car, car loans and mortgages, and, and both round up between 8% or 8.5% to like 12 or 10%. And so when you compare them to the rest, you might think, oh, it's not so bad. But then when you talk to people in other countries, for example, here in the US, how much are you guys paying for your mortgages? You know, 3%, 4%. So compare them to this, and it's crazy how people can actually own a house, pay a house, and, and be debit free at the end of their, of their retirement, right? So um, let's understand, you know, the socioeconomic conditions in Nicaragua and in Central America, I've made a small comparison um, of the different countries in Central America, and I've used Puerto Rico kind of like as a bridge with the US. There's also the US there so that you can compare them. And the reason why Puerto Rico to me is a bridge is because it's Latin, but it's still part of the US. So we have like a combination of both things here. So the GDP per capita in US dollars, this is annually, obviously, you can see that Nicaragua is the first one right there, very small. It's like $2,200. This is year, year round. And you have Puerto Rico in the middle. It's the blue one. And then you have the US. So when you look at those numbers, you see that our income is very, very low. Then you have our monthly minimum wage. In the case, in Nicar in the case of Nicaragua, our minimum wage is around $200. I actually um, had, had an interview a couple of months ago with um, two girls who have a podcast named Fire Drill. I don't know if you've heard of them. And so I, we were talking about, about the minimum wage, and, and, I, and I said this number, and then they wrote like a blog post uh, to, to add the, the podcast, and they said $200 weekly. And so I wrote to them and I said, you know, you have it wrong, it, it's monthly, please change it, and they changed it, but then I thought to myself, they might have thought, they, they, they probably thought, this is crazy, we made a mistake, so this must be weekly instead of monthly. But no, it's monthly. And obviously, in this case, Puerto Rico and the US, um, it's, it's the same because the minimum wage is $7.25 an hour, so we basically just translated it um, into a monthly basis to have like the same comparison. Now, the question is, with this uh, amount of money that people earn monthly, how much can they, they buy? So the basket of goods sold, and you can see how this changes entirely. How much does it cost, right? The, the, the basket of goods. 
the, the, the most expensive one is the one from Dominican Republic, and they actually had one of the lowest income. Uh, we're we're going to see later on how, how this compares. You see the U.S. in the middle, and then you see Nicaragua in the third place. What this means is um, in Nicaragua, people need 217% of their income just to acquire the basket of goods. So how do you do that? Basically, you don't. You don't get to buy the basket of goods entirely. You just buy a part of it. And so in comparison, in the US, people on average, if, you, if you're earning minimum wage, you only need to use 22% of your income to get that basket of goods, and you still have money left on minimum wage to buy other stuff. And you can see on those percentages, basically, how much of your income people need in different countries to cover that basket of goods sold. So my question is, you know, would you be able to afford a living under these circumstances? Would you? Would you? Who would be able to do it? You would? Really? OK. <laughs> um, another interesting thing is that there aren't that many large studies of financial education in any country in Central America. I've been doing this for seven years, and trust me, I've searched, and I've looked, and I've tried, and there's almost nothing there. So, you know, how much do we really know? So what I decided is, uh, you know, if there's nothing, I'm going to try to create something, and I'm going to try to have some numbers to at least have an idea of, of how this is working. And I've done a couple of surveys throughout the years and, and repeated some of them year by year to compare how people are are behaving in their you know financial lives so I'm going to show you a couple of numbers that come out from Nicaragua specifically and um, obviously from my, my, my blog followers so this is probably not as inclusive as it should be but it still gives us something so this is a survey uh, we ran last year only on savings uh, about a thousand two hundred people answered this survey and they said you know 57 percent of them said that they actually did save something uh, every month, 43% didn't save anything at all. Out of the reasons to save, you know, we asked them, why are you saving? What are your, what are your saving goals? So we differentiated them with men and women because, as you, know, you may know, we don't always handle personal finances the same way, uh, men and women. And so men uh, said, in, in the majority, 39% said to start a business. And you probably have heard that um, men usually take more risks than women, and women usually are more prone to look for security. And so when, when asked women what was their main reason for saving, 51% said an emergency fund, and then the, sec the second reason was to buy a house. So a house also gives you a lot of security. And to those who didn't save, when we asked them, why aren't you saving? Half of them said it's because they have too much debit, so obviously they have to spend too much uh, of their income to pay those debit, and they, they don't have enough to save. And 26% just said something always comes up. The interesting part of this is, was, was that when we compared the income from those who save and those who didn't save, they were exactly the same. So it's not income, and I'm sure you, all of you know this, it's not income that determines you know, your financial behavior, but habits. So even people who are earning $300 or $400 a month back home in Nicaragua, um, there, there's a portion who save, there's a, po a portion who doesn't save. Then we also ran this um, survey on debt, and this was also last year, but the funny thing is when I, when I graduated, I, I, I did an MBA in Taiwan in 2013. So when I was graduating, I did my thesis on how to increase financial literacy in Nicaragua. But to do that, I had to know where we were. So I, that was like my first survey back in 2012. And back then, when I asked, when, when I asked people, are you in debt, 66% said that they were in debt. Three years or four years later, that amount, that number went up to 87.5%. 87, 87 so most of the population has some kind of debt. And we're actually talking here about people who have some financial education because uh, they are already followers of the blog. So probably if you ask people who have never heard personal finance before, these numbers might be even higher. Um, the number one type of debit uh, people have is credit card with uh, 61%. Then you have uh, personal loans and then car loans. 
And the time that they will pay off their debit, it's, it's, most of them will take between a year and three years. So what this tells me is that most of them have consumist uh, type of, of credit, because if they had a car loan or if they had a mortgage, they would take a lot longer to pay off those debit. When asked uh, the, the percentage of income that goes towards debit, um, less than 10% of the, of the 11% of the people said that it took them less than 10%. 32% of the people said that it took between 11% and 30% of their income. And the majority of them, 57%, said that it took them over 30% of their income to pay their debits every month. 59% of those who, who had credit card debit were also carrying other kinds of debit. Only 11% had a car loan debit, and only 1% had a mortgage as the only debit that they owned. So how does, what does all this mean? You know, how, how, how do we translate this? And what I found is, first, people live day to day, literally day to day, day to day, because most of the work is informal. So you earn day by day, and you also spend day by day. Most debit is to consume, and with the highest interest rate, there's low to zero savings. Um, people get into financial commitments that they cannot pay later on. There's a high level of debit and there's a very, very low level of investment. And the reason is, is because if you're not saving anything at all, how can you invest? You know, there, I know that there are investments that don't require a lot of money, but all investments require some kind of money, at least a little bit. So if you're spending all of your money, there's really no room to, to, to improve, no room to invest. And so no way for you to improve the quality of your life. And so, you know, how do you provide financial advice under those circumstances? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience and what I've learned for these past almost seven years trying to teach personal finance under these circumstances. And, and the first step for me is understand that people have different realities, different realities from you, different realities from your, from your neighbors, and different realities even among them. Even, even in, in the Nicaraguan people, there are just different realities. And so it means that you need to treat them differently. There's different kind of publics, and you cannot prepare only one subject and then just spread it out and give it to everyone. So, for example, this is a group of women that I met in 2015, and I've been working with them for the past three years. They are from a community about 15 kilometers away from Nicaragua, and there is an NGO who's trying to help them out to have some income. So before this NGO came, these women had never, ever in their lives earned one cent. They're all married, and so their husbands uh, support them and support their, fa their family. And um, most of them, two of them don't know how to write or read, and the rest of them have only been to like the sixth grade. Um, and, and, and the picture, as you can see, is in one of the schools in their community. So the school has only two grades. And even though it's only 15 kilometers away from Managua, the capital city, it takes us about an hour and a half to get there just because the road is so bad. And so, you know, the, the, the language that you need to use with them has to be very, very simple with a lot of images, a lot of pictures. And um, you can't really... Uh, have a lot of numbers there because they probably, I mean, they, they don't know how to multiply, how to divide, so it has to be very, very simple. This is an example of something a little bit more, um, well, people that have a little bit more education. This was also, uh, this was taken last year. Uh, this is another example, and this is a private company. This is a big company in Nicaragua. It's called Cinta. It's kind of like a home buy uh, by Home Depot here in, in, in the United States. And so all of these people have some kind of education. And so you can treat them a little bit differently and, and, and the things that you can explain can be a little bit more deeper. And then this is a broader public. This is at a bank, at one of the biggest banks back home in Nicaragua. It's called Banco La Fise. And I've been working them for the past three and a half years. And part of what we do is we give free, free, free talks uh, or free workshops every three months to people. They don't have to pay for it. Uh, it's different subjects. And um, 
so every, every one of these, even though it might be the same subject, even though it might all be personal finance, uh, the, the, the way that we deliver the message has to be very differently. Once you understand that people have different realities, you have to have empathy with them. And, 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 and I want to tell you a, a, a bit about my story. When I first decided to, to dedicate my life to personal finance, my ideal business model was to provide financial coaching, like one-on-one. -on -one. And, 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 and that was my idea. I didn't like to speak. I was terrified to be in front of people talking to them. And so what I wanted to do was just one-on-one. -on -one. But when I started doing that, I realized that it was so time-consuming and, and it was really draining my energy and emotionally draining that I just couldn't do it. So about two years ago, I just stopped doing that. And um, what I want to show you right there is the, the first one is an, is an image of a blog post from, from my blog. This was written about two, two weeks ago. And, well, you have the translation of the title right there. It says, I went into debt for trying to get others in debt. This is the story of a guy who has a normal job, and he decided that he wanted to be a loan shark. He saw a lot of people in other offices who were doing great, who had, like, nice cars and went to nice restaurants, and, and that's what they were doing. So he thought, you know what, I'm going to do the same. So he didn't have the money, but he took out a loan at the bank to lend that money, and the first month, people paid, so it went well. But the second month, a lot of the people didn't pay. And by the third month, nobody was paying because, again, interest rate was so high that people, at first, they were excited, and then they discovered that they didn't have the budget to pay him. So he went, and he took out another loan because he had to pay the first loan to the bank. And the rest of the money, he lent it out to other people because people were asking for loans. So to make the story short, he took out three different loans at three different institutions, each one with a higher interest rate than the last one. And I would say the cherry of the pie was that he went to, to one of the stores that I mentioned before, where you can take out um, TVs or, or cameras or telephones or whatever. He took out some products at a 60% interest rate, and then he went to a pawn shop he took that there, he took the money to pay some of the other loans. So it, it turned into a huge mess. He basically lost his marriage because his wife had no idea of what was going on. And um, he said that he lost about 20 pounds in one month. So it was, it was really, really bad. And um, he sent his testimony. I, I, I asked his, for his permission to post it on the blog, obviously without his name because he didn't you know, want people to know whom he was. And I feel like I've created this community that where not only I have empathy, but the rest of the people who read the blog and who follow on social media also have empathy. I was scared, to be honest, in the beginning that some people might criticize him and say, well, you know, that's what happens because you become a shark loan. But people were actually very nice in their messages, supporting him, you know, sending him their, their blessings, telling him that he was going to get out of it eventually. And the other image that I want to show you and one of the key messages about having empathy and one of the reasons why I also decided to stop giving uh, advisory is because an hour of advisory was allowed me to help one person, the person who was paying for that advisory. But then I have like so many different emails and messages every single day. To give you an idea, I receive between 30 and 40 different messages from people every single day. And I answer them every single one of them. Probably the same day. Sometimes it might, take, it might take me a day or two days. But I decided that that hour was better spent you know, to help more people than just to help one person. And so that, that's an image of my inbox. I don't know if you can see it from there, but you can see the different times. It's all between, there's like six messages there, and it's all between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m., and they're all checked. So I've, I've answered every one of those emails, and that's part of being empathetic with the people who follow you. So after that, you need to accept, and this was one of the hardest parts for me, you have to accept that there are things that not all of them are going to be able to do, and you have to let it go, and you have to remove them from your advice. And one of those is retirement. Retirement is super important, right? And we should all be focused on it. And 
For example, here you all have 401ks, and, 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 and that's one of the top uh, personal finance advice from almost everyone, to invest in your, for, or in your 401k or to invest in something else, to have something for your retirement. But I know, and, and I started saying that back home, and people thought I was crazy. Like, literally, people were like, are you out of this world? I can barely live today, and you're asking me to save for when I'm 60 years old. And so at the beginning, I was like, you know, these people, this is so important, and they don't understand it. But when you start meeting people, you know, face-to-face, -face, and you understand their stories, and you understand how they live, you understand that it was crazy to provide that advice. So I let it go. I let it go, and I stopped saying that. And so... Uh, I, those two posts right there is an example of things that you kind of let go, but maybe not entirely, because there's always going to be a, a few people who need that advice, and they can do better if you provide it. This is obviously not about retirement. This is about traveling. Traveling was, was, was one of the other things that I had to remove from my advice, uh, because most of the people are not able to travel back in Nicaragua. And so the first blog post was written in January this year, um, here's my husband right there doing a Facebook Live for my platform. And so we came with his son to Universal Studios in December, and I, I wrote a post on it, and, and I explained how we did it, and how much it cost, and how we budgeted, and how we saved, and everything. And people liked it, but I only write that once every two years. I cannot write about that every single time. What I can write about is about Holy Week. So if you're Catholic, in, at least in Central America, uh, you always celebrate Holy Week, and in Nicaragua, because it's such a hot country, like, we have between 30 and 37 Celsius degrees all year round. This is a very hot, hot country. What people like to do back home is go to the beach on Holy Week. So even if it's just, if it's just one day, people will go to the beach, even if you're earning $200 a month. So that is something that I write about every single year on tips on how to save, how to spend less, and this is an example of something that I wrote last year, and it included a basic budget on, you know, how many days are you planning on going, what are the things are you planning on doing, add it up, you know, how many days do you have to get there so that you can actually save and not be in debt when you, once you come back, because that's something that people do a lot. You know, they see something and they say, I want to do that. They see an offer and they say, I want to take that offer because it's going to help me save, but they don't have the money, so they'll put it on their credit cards or they're, they're, they will go to a loan shark, ask for the money, go on vacation, and then when they come back, they're going to spend, you know, six months paying for something that it took them a week to, to enjoy. You, sh you should also help them accept, you know, the, the, the advice before was, uh, you have to accept that there are things you're not going to be able to do and you should remove them, but you can help them accept it, showing them what they can do. Because obviously there are things that they're going to be able to do, like the Holy Week celebration. And I want to show you a video right now of something that they can do that includes, you know, personal finance advice. And it's going to take them longer, but they're going to be able to do it eventually. And I hope this video works. So I'm going to cross my, my fingers. It's, it, it has subtitles. It's in Spanish, but it has subtitles. Hola, chicos. Constantemente me están pidiendo consejos útiles para mejorar su vida financiera. Por eso hemos decidido crear esta serie donde en cada capítulo vamos a ver un tema diferente. Hoy comenzaremos con tips para que le saque el jugo a tus remesas. Son varios los tips que puedas tomar en cuenta para hacer un uso inteligente de tus remesas. Número uno, busca la opción que te ofrezca el menor costo. Calcula ese costo no nada más en base a la transferencia, sino también al tipo de cambio. Número dos, planea los envíos con anticipación. Los envíos urgentes son más caros. Si la comisión que te cobra aumenta proporcionalmente con la cantidad de dinero que envías, prueba hacer varios envíos más pequeñitos. Número 3. Administra tus remesas con cuidado. En caso de cobrar tus remesas en efectivo, puedes abrir una cuenta de ahorro en Banco La Fice para depositar ahí tu dinero y tener un mayor control sobre el dinero que gastes. 4. Gasta menos e invertir más. La idea general es que gastes lo menos posible para invertir lo más que se pueda en cosas que mejorarán tu calidad de vida de manera permanente y no solo temporal. 5. Ahorra mínimo el 10% de tus remesas. Al cabo de unos años, este dinero te permitirá ver materializados sueños que siempre has tenido. 
Por ejemplo, comprar una casa, un terreno, un vehículo o cualquier otro bien duradero. 6. Emprender. Puedes utilizar el dinero ahorrado para montar un pequeño negocio o bien para comprar equipos para el negocio que ya tenés. Esto es todo por hoy, lo espero pronto para más plata tips de finanzas personales. So, you know, I talk about saving. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. Um, so I did talk about saving, I did talk about in investment, I did talk about entrepreneurship, but I did it from a point of view that I know people would identify with, which is remittances. Because um, from, from the income that our country gets, between 10 and 11% annually comes from remittances. And from those, 57% come from the U.S. It's money, so it's money that people from other countries will send to people at our home country. So we have a lot of people immigrating, especially to the United States, Costa Rica, and Spain, and then they will send money to their families to help them out. So that. Focus on financial self-esteem rather than financial knowledge. So this is a phrase that we hear a lot back home. You know, since I'm always going to be in the same position, since I'm always going to earn the same, I just, you know, I'd rather just spend it all at once because it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to live today because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And um, this is all content that we're creating in, in, in the different uh, social media platforms. And I would, last, would like to ask you, what do you see there? What does that look like on the green image? It's Yoda and it's a credit card. It's the force. <laughs> exactly. So we, we constantly try different kinds of, um, of content to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, we, were, we were discussing, there, there's a group of you know, great Latin people right here. And um, we, we've been discussing this this past few days, and one of the things we, we th that we came to the conclusion was that people in the States read a lot more than people in Latin America. So we're all bloggers, but it's hard to get people to read. So sometimes images like this one, no words, will hopefully, you know, get the message out without having to change their entire habits or the entire culture. And I have another small video right here. I want to apologize in advance because we didn't have a chance to translate it, but hopefully you'll get the idea and I can explain later on what it's about. Ernesto siempre se despierta tarde para ir a trabajar. You can guess. Por eso todos los días tiene que irse en taxi. Aproximadamente gasta 60 Córdobas al día. En promedio gasta semanalmente 300 Córdobas en transporte, es decir, 1200 Córdobas al mes. Él no tiene ni idea de cuánto gasta anualmente. Si Ernesto cambiara sus hábitos y se levantara un poquito más temprano, perfectamente podría tomar el bus o el ride de su mamá y se ahorraría 14400 Córdoba en un año. ¿Y vos cuánto gastás? ¿Por qué no buscas alternativas más económicas? Echale números. So, anyone want to guess what it's about? Carpooling, transportation, what else? Not the Latin people, we can ask you later. Wake up earlier, and then? Walk, okay. So it's, it's around that, exactly. It's about how people will, and, and I know this is also common here, will wake up late, and then um, you're not able to take the bus that you regularly take. So this is another thing right here. People, most of the people will drive their cars. And, and probably you would focus on, on breakfast and say, have breakfast at home, don't buy breakfast. In Nicaragua, the focus would have to be, you know, don't take a cab, but take the bus, because the majority of the people will take the bus, which is a lot cheaper. And so the video is about that and, and, and the difference, the, the different amount that people, uh, that the person, the guy here on the video would spend if he actually took the bus and how much he would save weekly, uh, monthly, and then annually. And the echale numeros that appears at the end basically means, you know, put some numbers down and, and think a little bit about how much you're spending. 
Fifth is create specialized and dif differentiated, I'm sorry for my accent, guys, but different content for them using different formats for different social media. This also obviously applies here. So these are our different platforms, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Our biggest one is Facebook. We have around 55,000 um, followers. And I, obviously, it depends on where you are and, and, you know, where the people are. In the case of Nicaragua, because there's not a lot of internet penetration, then um, be, most of the people are going to be on Facebook and, and, and less people on the other social media. So that's like our, our biggest one and we, where we have uh, our focus. Uh, Twitter account is more used to uh, share relevant news because the decision-making uh, people or managers or business owners are going to be more on Twitter than on Facebook. Um, YouTube, obviously, we only do videos, and we found that a lot of the international community that comes to Plata Con Platica, the blog, come through YouTube, and then I use Instagram more to share a little bit more about my personal life, kind of like the behind the scenes, how we do the things we do. So if we post on Facebook one of the videos that I just show you, we'll usually have on Instagram, you know, the day that we were filming it and some bloopers of what was going on. And then this also applies to, you know, the offline media. I know it says online, but even the offline media. And so this is a couple of the things that, that I do or used to do until a couple of months ago. Um, this is a TV show, the first one called Evas Urbanas. It, it literally means Your Urban Eves. And it's a TV show designed for women. Uh, I had a TV segment there for about two years. And their public was a little bit more specialized, so we were able to talk um, more about the things that I don't really get to talk on my blog. Um, the second one is a type of Good Morning America kind of show and had a segment there for about five years. And this is a very, very low income focused TV show. It's a program that goes from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. So it's mostly um, housewives that, that are watching it. So this was even lower income than what my usual blog followers uh, had. So the content was even more simple than, I, than what I usually talk on, on my blog or on social media. And then this is a free magazine. And because it's free, everyone, everyone can read it. But then it also means that you need to be very, very careful with what you share because you don't want to be saying something that doesn't apply to everyone. Because I think it goes to about 90,000 people. So it, it has to be very basic. And then... This is a newspaper. It's the second biggest newspaper back home in Nicaragua. And this is where I get to talk the more or, or the most about more complicated topics that I don't get to say in, uh, anywhere else. And finally, the business model has to be different. And the reason why it's different is because people can pay you. So I cannot write an ebook or a book or design a course or design, you know, whatever, whatever I want to design and charge it to the people individually because they're earning $200 a month and they cannot even buy the basic basket of goods, right? So how can they pay for something in personal finance? So what I do back home is that I have two kinds of customers. I have the customer which is my main customer, who is the one receiving all the products, receiving the information, which are all my blog readers and social media followers. And then I have my second customer, which is the one who's paying me to do all of that. And so what I do is that I partner with big brands, with big companies in Nicaragua, who will pay for this content. So I, I mentioned the bank earlier. Actually, if you, if you noticed on the first video that was translated, it did have the logo in, in the end. But the, 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 the focus here has to be, and, and to me, that's, my, that, that's the question that I ask is, you know, if this company wasn't paying me to do this, would I, would I still be doing it? And if the, question's, if the answer's no, then I don't do it. Because your first customer, you know, your reader, that's, that's your focus. And the second that you lose that and the, and, and, and the second that you decide that partnering with that company is more important to you because obviously there's money involved, then in the long run or even in the medium uh, run, it's not, it's not going to work because you're going to lose your main customer. So this is different things that we've done. Uh, the, the first one we did 
in, in, in December. This was a small saving campaign with a brand um, that it's called Toto. It's a Colombian brand. And what they do is they sell backpacks, book bags. Um, they're, they're more focused on children and, and teenagers. And so they had this campaign for Christmas, and we had like three different events where we invited children, I mean their parents, uh, who were aged between, I think it was five and eight years old, and, and we gave them free piggy banks, and they had to save for an entire year, so that's going to be right now in December. So whatever the kids save during this year, the, the store is going to double the amount, obviously to buy at their shop, but it's still double the amount. Um, the second one that you see there, it's, uh, we call them Plata con Platica Live. It's basically a Facebook Live with a little bit more production, more like a kind of, kind of like a TV show. And obviously you can see the brand right there. And they had a campaign called El Orgullo de Emprender, which means the pride to be an entrepreneur. So I wrote different kind of contents and did different kind of videos and Facebook Lives for them. And it's all, you know, good information. It's original information. We're not selling a car. We're not selling absolutely anything. The, the brand just needed for, to be in the top of mind of entrepreneurs, basically. And then these two are what we call downloadable content. Um, this is a budget, this is 2018, and this is an ebook on credit. And um, what we do is we co brand it. So I will partner with X brand, let's say a bank or an insurance company, depending on what the content is. And I write the entire content. They don't, they don't get to you know, say a say, have a saying on, on, on what we're creating, and then we'll just have both logos, like the Plata Con Platica logo and their own logo. And it's obviously all free for the people. So we have you know, 3,000, 5,000 down downloads for all of this content. It's a population of 6 million people, so having that amount, it, it's, it's really quite a lot. And I'm running out of time, so um, lessons learned to me, uh, resuming this is, first, understand that people have different realities, have empathy with them, accept that there are things not all of them are going to be able to do, and you should, you know, let it go, remove them from your advice, help them accept it by showing them what they can do, focus on financial self-esteem rather than financial knowledge, create specialized content for them, and the business model is different, right? Companies need to subsidize your time so that you can advise to those who cannot pay you. And you know, my question to you is, would you provide financial advice to those with a low income? Would you? Yes, yes? thank you. <laughs>